for having me here today. Uh, sorry if I haven't been a good attendance myself, but that's because usually Friday's my racquetball time. But I'm not doing racquetball today to talk to you about the mammoth. I'm happy to do so. Okay, so I want to do this in some pieces, um, and I'm going to make sure that I do this show and tell early, and I'm going to pass these around. Um, so some of you are distantly spaced, so I can walk around something. Uh, and then I also want to make sure to start off here pretty quick with a uh, maybe slightly humorous and maybe unintentionally slightly humorous um, video. So <clears throat> when we did this mammoth thing, there was a bunch of popular interest, and a number of people heard about us. And one of those things was oh, let's start again. One of those things was uh, the History Channel. Start it over again and see if it cooperates to what I wanted to do. Why not? Okay, so uh, did anybody see the movie 10,000 BC? <laughs> okay, I hear some laughs. So I assume then that you have some thoughts about the factual content of that movie, right? And usually those thoughts aren't very positive thoughts. Um, because, like, for example, for people who have not seen the movie, one of the scenes in that movie is the. Uh, the pyramids are being built, and the pyramids are being built with the help of mammoths. You know, to drag the stones up, right? Which is, which would be nice if they could do that. You know, there's some problems with that in terms of timing and whatnot. Um, but so the the History Channel knew that this movie 10,000 BC was coming out, and they wanted to have. They, occasionally, they like to release things to go along with the hype of a movie, right? So they were going to make their own video that they wanted to release the same time as 10,000 BC except they were going to call it Journey to 10,000 BC, and it was supposed to be what actually happened instead of what Hollywood said happened. So that was the gist of what they were trying to accomplish. Um, and so they basically went around and they hired this guy to go out and shoot documentary film and put it together into the, the History Channel's sort of answer to the movie. And there's a couple of things you've got to keep in mind about this video. It is a documentary. It is a purportedly factual documentary, but it is on the History Channel. So... <laughs> Um, what does that mean exactly? Well, you may have a little bit of grain of salt here and there, and you got to remember what the objectives of the filmmaker were. So in the case of this guy, when he came out to visit us, you know, he talked to me about his vision. A couple of things he said caught my attention immediately. One of those was that drama makes good television, conflict makes good drama. Okay, so what? how does that relate to me? <coughs> that means he... He kept asking me all these leading questions where he wanted me on film to say things that were outrageous or controversial or something like that so that they would then generate other things that have happened in the video. And I decided early on I wasn't going to play that game. Um, so he would say, can you say this? And I'd say no. He'd say, can you say this? And I'd say no. And he said, well, can you say what you said before with more enthusiasm? <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, that's kind of how it went throughout the video. Um, he kept wanting to talk about things that were very controversial. I wanted him to go to the people, the big names that are arguing those things and let them get in trouble instead of me. Um, so anyway, but he did interject some things in there and add some drama. You know, it's the History Channel. They like some drama. So um, you'll see that we're, we're in this for about 15 minutes. So in the, in the 10,000 BC movie, they had this stuff with the mammoths. So they wanted to have something about mammoths in their documentary, and they looked around and asked some people that are, that are well-published names in the, like the extinction of mammoths and stuff like that, and there's not that many places in the United States where there are actual sort of scientific excavations of uh, mammoths going on. A lot of times in paleontology, it's more of a recovery in a hurry because you don't have much time. They're doing a construction project. You know, we were going slow. We were trying to get all kinds of information, so they came and got us for a couple of days. So they put about, there's about 15 minutes of this video that's got CW and our excavation, which is always great. I think anything that has CW put out there uh, by any of us is, is, a, is good for all of us. You know, people have heard about our university in a good way. That's a good thing. So anyway, um, I'm going to just run this from the beginning, and then you'll have, to have about five minutes of intro, and then you'll get to our bit. How do you know when you get to our bit? Don't take this the wrong way or anything, but when the banjos start, you know it's not. Right? <laughs> I don't know if I should make anything of that, but it's interesting. Uh, on, the, on the plus end, the, the landowners, uh, who I'll mention again later, uh, one of them is a, a banjo player that plays regularly, all kinds of stuff, banjo. She even made up a song, a banjo song about the dig, which you won't hear. 
anyway, uh, and then for a caveat, I should mention that, um, okay, so this has been on the History Channel, I don't know, 20 or 30 times, probably mostly at 2 a.m. or something. Uh, it's two hours long. The first hour is not bad in terms of like tracking with what most scientists think is reasonable. It gets a little weirder in the second hour because, as I said, this mineral maker wanted controversy and stuff like that. So he really focused on some hypotheses that most of the scientific community do not think are very good, like people came over to the Americas across the frozen North Atlantic. Um, so because he did that, he created some things later in the video that some people might even find offensive. So like he, so he had people cross over essentially from Europe, right, to get to North America. So, well, what happens then? You've got to have Native Americans here at some point, right? So he has a scene later in the video where he has an actor pretending to be the European and an actor pretending to be the Native American in hand-to-hand -hand combat for the control of North America, right? This is not based on anything most legitimate science-type people would you know, want to do. But anyway, that's where he went. So like what my neighbor saw, he said, that Atlantic crossing, that's the theory, right? <laughs> Not really, but okay, so we'll roll with this, and then when we kind of get to where the part about us kind of drops off, I will just viciously cut us off when they start talking about California. <laughs> um, not that I'm, you know, I'm married to California, so that's not a problem. But. Okay, so I don't usually work in this room, so what lights do I do here? On the panel. Oh, the restaurant. In front of you. Mm -hmm. Oh, lights. Does the computer one work well? How's that? You like that? That's good. Right. Oh, right. Historic beasts and armor. For three million years, they ruled North America. But their supremacy is about to be challenged. For the first time, humans entered the continent. Around 10,000 BC, people were coming into a completely new world. But this is a new world of deadly uncertainty. The early human populations around 10,000 BC would have been out there on the landscape not only as predators, they may have been prey. Prehistoric humans clash with the mega beasts of the age. And confront an abrupt and devastating climate change. If you don't adapt, you're not going to survive. This is the extraordinary journey of how prehistoric humans faced a terrifying new world. It is the end of the last great ice age, known as the Pleistocene era. A time when expansive glaciers blanketed the northern hemisphere. Most scientists believe that prehistoric humans have been to virtually every habitable landmass on Earth. But a final frontier remains untouched, the Americas. We think about the history of the Americas. Uh, many people think about pilgrims and Columbus maybe even and Jamestown. But we have to recognize that there is actually a period in history uh, when people ventured into this land and absolutely no one else lived here. Imagine looking around and not seeing any campfires on the horizon. Not seeing any freshly killed animals. Not seeing any evidence whatsoever that other humans were out there. 
It was probably a fairly eerie feeling. For over a century, scientists have attempted to solve the mystery of how and when humans first arrived in the New World and what dangers these prehistoric people faced. If we can set the ecological stage on which this play takes place, we can better understand how it is that folks adapted to this fundamentally very new world. What we're trying to understand is how did these people live? How did these people survive 10,000 BC? To understand how humans survived this dangerous new world, scientists across the globe sift through the literal sands of time and uncover the missing pieces of the prehistoric puzzle. Answers lay buried in the graves of prehistoric man's prey. Near Central Washington University, Dr. Pat Lubinsky and his team hunt for the remains of these prehistoric monsters. Every summer we come out here with a team of students and scientists from several different disciplines, including archaeology, paleontology, and geomorphology. We have eight weeks to try to get all the information we can before we run out of time for the field season so we can learn as much as we can about the past and that little short window. The scientists dig a series of square holes and painstakingly sift through the soil. There's sort of this detective work stuff. There's these little clues you can have, and each of those little clues might help you figure out something that's going on in the past. So just like people might do on CSI or something. You're like a detective scene, right? You're trying to glean all the information you possibly can from all the little clues you can pick up. Hey guys, I have a suggestion. If this part here where you've been exposing it, that looks good. Dr. Lubinsky and his team dig at Weenus Creek because of an accidental archaeological discovery. In 2005, a backhoe operator excavating a private road strikes a large bone in the ground. At first, he believes he has unearthed part of a dinosaur. But scientists from Central Washington University quickly determine that the bone is not old enough to belong to a creature from the Jurassic. This is the first bone that we found on the project. Once we brought it back to the lab and we put it back together, it's about three feet long when you put it all together. Just looking at the length of this arm bone all together, it's not too hard to figure out the total size of the animal because we know the relationship between the bone and the total height. Its massive size tells Lubinsky that the bone can only belong to one animal, a mammoth. With a three foot long arm bone, this beast is likely 15 feet tall and can weigh as much as 20,000 pounds. After the accidental discovery of the upper left arm bone, Dr. Lubinsky calls for a full archaeological investigation. So the road is rerouted and Dr. Lubinsky starts digging. Within a year, the team discovers the mammoth's other upper arm bone. Today, they are uncovering the mammoth's left scapula or shoulder blade. Dr. Lubinsky believes the bones are from the same animal. Since the two upper arm bones, the two humeri that we have so far, are the same length, it's very likely the same animal. And since that uh, scapula is not too far away from those, it seems very likely that it probably is going to be the one that fits. The earliest fossil records date mammoths to about 3 million years old. There are several different species of mammoths, but none larger than the Columbian mammoth. Named after Christopher Columbus, the Columbian mammoth is found only in North America and is the largest beast to set foot on Earth since the dinosaurs. Lumbering along the plains, consuming upwards of 700 pounds of grass every day, the Columbian mammoth spends about 20 hours a day eating. Just imagine being out there on the landscape and seeing one or a herd of these things. Not only are they enormous, but they have these massive tusks jutting out of their faces. Now, tusks, you have to realize, are actually teeth. They're the animal's incisors. And they begin to develop when the animal is born. 
and they continue growing throughout the animal's life. One could argue exactly what they were used for, but I have to think that they were definitely part of a mating thing. Two big alpha males going head to head over territory of the female. Dr. Lubinsky has not yet found any tusk remains at the site. A lot of people think the best thing to find would be a tusk, like this one from Alaska. And it's definitely cool because they give us a sense of how huge the animal is. But we would much rather find some teeth because teeth can give us a lot more information. A mammoth tooth gives scientists insights into the animal's age, its diet, and its exact species. Like Mastodon, who is smaller and subsists on twigs and other wood-like vegetation. And like Woolly Mammoth, one of the most famous creatures of the period. The Woolly's fur coat staves off the harsh winters of the Northern Hemisphere, which remain below freezing for two-thirds of the year. And of course, there is the mammoth with the largest teeth, the Columbian Mammoth. This is a single tooth of a Columbian Mammoth. It's actually the left third molar. It has these enamel plates in here to process the tons and tons of foliage that they eat every year. In fact, these animals ate very rough foliage like grasses and uh, things with silica in it. And so, therefore, they had to have this big, large tooth in order to maintain their life for 60 years or more. What may be the most significant find at the Weenus Creek site does not come from a mammoth. We found a lot of large bones on the site, and those are definitely the most eye-catching. But what could be the most significant is this. The edges of this small flake of rock suggest to scientists that it has been broken deliberately, crafted into an ancient tool or weapon. This small flake of rock is man-made. If Dr. Lubinsky eventually determines that the flake is related to the death of the mammoth, he will have evidence that humans prowled these lands over 12,000 years ago, hunting mammoths. About a thousand miles south of the Weenus Creek Mammoth Site, on the Channel Islands off the coast of California, Gives you a decent intro. I heard some people laughing in the part. I always think it's the funny scene, the people walking down the road with implements of destruction, <laughs> which was, I can't remember, three takes or five takes uh, to get it to the one. Some people think it's a Reservoir Dogs reference, but anyway. Um, okay, so a little bit of a follow up then after that kind of a little bit funny, but decent introduction in another way. First of all, I wanted to make sure to uh, acknowledge some people. And that most important people to acknowledge are the landowners, because this is on private property, and there really aren't a lot of rules about what has to happen to paleontological remains. So if the landowners wanted to, they could have dug them up and sold them on eBay, and it would have been totally legal. Uh, they didn't want to do that. They were very interested all along. So when the finds were first made during construction for their daughter's house, basically a road to their daughter's house, they called up somebody at the university and had somebody come out. That was Morris Hubelacher. And then um, after we looked at it, came out and looked at it a few more times, they were very interested in trying for us to have a <coughs> summer field program out there to have it investigated. And once we got rolling with that, they really wanted to have the general public <coughs> permitted to come out. We had tours and stuff like that, um, all because of their interest. Um, so really, if it wasn't for Doug and Braun, none of this would have happened at all. And this is just to give you some sense of their interest level. So Braun uh, liked to paint, and this was her first painting when she envisioned there'd be multiple mammoths, and she did basically a different painting painting every year. And they sold t-shirts with different designs from the different paintings that she'd done and stuff like that. Um, so they were really into it. Uh, and then we've had, um, we had, of course, university help and help from some local businesses with hoses and stuff like that, uh, and all the students doing the project as well. So when we first, the first piece that was found in construction was this one, which looked like this after we put it back together in the lab. And so we know it's a mammoth for a couple of reasons right off the bat. One is 
probably many of you know, but maybe not everybody, is we don't actually have much in the way of dinosaurs in this state. So if you get a big animal, you only got so many choices. Well, it's not, I used to be able to say we have not found a dinosaur yet, but yes, you're right, there's one that has been found now. But that was a foreign invader that floated up on the shore from somewhere else anyway. So, so far, we really don't have any. So in Washington, mammoths really kind of are our dinosaurs. And if you get a bone that's kind of this size range, and this is uh, clearly a left upper arm bone, a left humerus, we can say that it's a mammoth because, uh, as I put on the little collars there, because of the shape of that ridge, a mammoth is like that, and a mastodon has a much different angle there, so we can rule out mastodons. Um, and then I did take a sample and sent it to a, a PhD student at McMaster University who was doing his dissertation on the uh, genetics of mammoths in North America to try to sort out the uh, logistics there. Anyway, he says it's clearly in the Columbian mammoth clade and not the woolly mammoth clade. Um, the rest of it, of the taxonomy, is confusing. But when they did the video, they didn't know that. They just said Columbian. But it turns out they're probably right. It was a Columbian mammoth. Okay, so the fine location is between us here in Ellensburg and down in Yakima. If you Remember, if you've gone down to Yakima, there's three ridges that you go over. Once you go over the third one, uh, south of Tainum, there is a kind of a green valley there. That's the Weenass Valley. Um, but I decided very early on that based on where I grew up, that I would have a hard time with a straight face to keep saying Weenass all the time, because it sounds like something you like, <laughs> right? So I decided that even though that's the correct pronunciation for that part of the world, that I would just put the word creek after it so I could just slur it together into Weenus Creek and not have to say that all the time. Um, so I've gotten in trouble with some locals, but most people don't know anyway, so it's working out okay. Okay, so we, uh, the, all the field work was basically uh, teaching opportunities for students. So we did it as a field school for six years from the summer of 2005 when we didn't know if we'd find anything at all, frankly. Uh, through the summer of 2010, and this is just some of the field school shots. You can get another view of how the landowners were interested because Brown painted a mammoth crossing sign, and then after a few years she wanted a better mammoth crossing sign that was worse for scale, that was reflective and stuff like that. Um, so that gives you some sort of feel for the interest level there. Okay, so you saw the field work pretty reasonably represented there in the History Channel video. Um, we did finished field work in 2010. And sometimes people are ask, asking, well, why stop? I mean, really, frankly, the landowners would love it if we were still out there, because there'd be people visiting and all kinds of stuff happening out there. But really, as an as a archeologist, a professional archeologist, I really can't do that, because for one thing, you know, after six years, I have a whole bunch of big bones, and I need to do something with those. It's not really ethical for us to just keep digging stuff up and not do some sort of analysis and reporting of that. And then uh, I wanted to kind of end in a logical spot. After five seasons, I had all these square holes with all those dirt walls between them, right? Well, there's stuff in the dirt walls, too. So I needed to have a year where I could kind of work taking all those bolts out so we didn't leave them permanently in those little uh, sections. And then lastly, uh, another sort of ethical consideration for people in my field is if there's a site that's not immediately threatened, right, so it's going to be there for a while, we usually feel like you have to leave some for the future because methods will no doubt improve. You know, I don't think that the culmination of human experience in archaeology is you know, me, and so I might as well dig it all up because nobody can do better. I don't believe that. So since things are definitely going to get better in the future, I should leave some. You know, we could get to where methods or imaging techniques say are so good, people don't even dig anymore because they can get all the data that they went through some kind of instrument. All right, I just wanted to mention, so this public relations stuff, besides when we were open, uh, we had tours. So we had almost 9,000 people come out and visit the site. I had tours every half hour with tour guides and stuff like that. Um, a bunch of times the news pe newspaper and television people came out. And then since then, we've done lots of uh, public outreach. Um, so this is when I was, I went to Wenatchee for an Ice Age Fair or something event, and school kids came by. Um, it's nice to be able to have uh, casts of some of your bones to be able to use for that kind of purpose. 
and I'll do that for us here in just a minute. Okay, so what did we find? So after that six summers of excavation, this was a road that was being built to Heather's house over there. And this is about where that first bone was found by a backhoe. Um, I say about because that was in February and I didn't get out there until May. And they had dumped a whole bunch of dirt on top of it in the meantime and it was hard to figure out where anything was from. But we started there and kind of expanded out. So all this blue area here is a, a block of excavation. You know, as we found stuff, we kept expanding. This little L-shaped thing was a backhoe trench. And the gray areas, we also did a ground penetrating radar survey to see if it would help us. It did. OK, so out of the mammoths, what did we get? So here's a graphic. All the red things there basically are the bones that we got. So not a complete mammoth. And then this is a sort of a top view of the excavation block that was blue last time. All these black pieces are bone. So like this is the scapula that we were excavating in that History Channel video. So you can see it's not like an all laid out articulated skeleton of a mammoth. It's a more confusing mixed up mess, basically. Um, okay. But there wasn't just mammoth, it turns out. So there's also bison and some other things. The bison distribution is a little funny because it's just one left rear leg. And then recently I, I radiocarbon dated some other, and there's a little bit of the backbone, but um, not like the whole animal of, at all. Which of course lends itself very nicely to the joke about you know the three-legged bison running around out there without its leg. Um, it turns out that uh, there's also been people that have asked, well, why the heck do you have bison and mammoth at the same site? Well, it actually is not that complicated. So in the video, they said that mammoth ate what? Grass. Grass. Yes. So, and what do bison eat? Grass. Grass. So is it too surprising they die in the same kind of places? No. So it turns out that a lot of mammoth sites have bison remains there. Also, sort of sensible in terms of if animals die in these places naturally, they sort of sort out. There's also uh, smaller animals, which we usually call microfauna, um, things like ground squirrels. But um, we have a kind of an interpretive problem with ground squirrels and pocket gophers. Anybody think of a reason why ground squirrels and pocket gophers' bones, from the same levels where my mammoth and bison bones are, are a little difficult to interpret? Because they did, exactly. They're burrowing animals. So, how do you know they have anything to do with the mammoth and the bison, or that they weren't just from much later in time and they burrowed down there and died in their burrows, right? And the short answer is you don't. It's not easy to tell. Unless, when we're identifying them, I happen to see that this is a Pleistocene age ground squirrel or something. Maybe then we got something to work with, but it's not that straightforward. And then, as you saw in the History Channel bit, maybe some artifacts too. Okay, I'm going to. Stop this for a minute, go to the show and tally thing, then come back. I'm changing lights. Just so I don't run out of time. Okay, so um, we had an art student that was really interested in the project, and he had some experience making casts. And so he offered to make casts of some of the things that we had excavated, which is great. So then we could have them. We've made multiple copies. Some at the museum, some to the landowner, etc. Uh, and then I've got some nice things to use for talks like this. So some people saw I had this out first. So anybody know what that one is? It's depicted in that. Okay, what element that is? Any ideas? Wild guesses. Okay, pelvis is not a bad guess, but if you have probably if you're having a hard time with scale, right? See if this helps with scale. Here is the human one, plastic cat. It is the first vertebra. So this is the first neck vertebra. And actually, I've always struck with how similar it really looks to a human first neck vertebra. And as I was saying a little bit earlier before we started, if you think about how human heads sit on top of our, our backbones versus how a, a mammoth is, that's kind of similar. Their heads are kind of on top of their backbones, right? As opposed to, say, a cow where your, their heads are straight out in front. So their first vertebrae look very, very different than this. But these look pretty similar. So I'm going to pass these things around. Um, this 
particular cast that was theater made by Alfred Keller, was the art student, um, who then became a grad student. He put some weights in this one so that it would be about the same weight as the real one. So this is the same weight as the actual bone. The real bone is, uh, maybe just pass it on once you've had it. The real bone is in the museum on the ground floor at Dean Hall. Hey, but that's kind of interesting, but a lot of people think this is a much higher impact uh, kind of bone to have. So, uh, do you know what that is? It's a long bone. Which long bone is it? Arm or leg? Arm or leg. Well, you got 50-50 chance, right? So, anyway, it's a leg bone. So this is, this is uh, where it goes into the pelvis, right? And then this here is where the kneecap slides, right? So if I was going to put this in the correct anatomical position, right, clearly it's taller than me, right? The knee's not in the right place. But to get a sense of scales where that one here is a, a cast of a bison femur, which actually, uh, I don't know if you've ever thought about it, but we are an odd animal. Our femur is much longer than a bison. We have very long space there before our, compared to most four-legged animals. And for both these casts, he painted them to be like the original, and all these cracks and stuff are what it looked like when we excavated it out. And on the back side of this one, sometimes people ask me what these little, is this some sort of casting process? No, these are spots where I took my little... Uh, hole saw on my electric drill, and I sawed out pieces, which felt a little sacrilegious. But anyway, it was a good way to get samples before we painted it with this stuff to consolidate the bone to hold it together, which then would have contaminated the radiocarbon samples and stuff like that. So I wanted some unaltered bone to begin with. By the way, if anybody has any questions or anything, you can go ahead and you don't have to wait. Uh, and then there's some other funny things like this lumpy piece here. I decided to leave that on because when we took this piece out, it was laying on top of some uh, ribs, and a piece of rib stuck there when it came off. And I thought, oh, let's just leave that there for uh, for more of the story. So, so that's a cast. That's not an actual bone, right? Yeah, the actual one is in the the museum on oh, ground okay. floor. Deep. This one's a little bit lighter than the original. Okay. Um, but as somebody was asking me earlier, the, the original is not that heavy. These are bone, they're not fossil, right? So they're not rocks. So they're, you know, heavy enough to support a big animal, but they're not like, like you can't lift them up or anything. Okay, while those are circulating, I will go back to my regularly scheduled program. Okay, so how old is it? We use two different methods to try to figure out how old it was. Um, I had seven different samples that I sent for radiocarbon dating, which basically dates how long it's been since something has died. So the bison and the mammoth both died somewhere about 16 to 17,500 years ago. And then I used another method. It's nice if you can have two different methods with their own problems and assumptions and stuff uh, come into agreement with each other. So there's another method called infrared stimulated luminescence dust dating. It's got a nice long name. Uh, basically what it does is it dates how long it's been since a little grain of sand has seen the sunshine. So I took, in this example, these two big yellow dots are where I drove a piece of plastic pipe into the ground to get some dirt in there, and wrapped it up, kept it dark, sent it to a lab, and they took a little bit of grains from the very center of that pile of dirt and they told me that this sample last saw the sunshine sometime between 12,000 and 16,000 years ago, and this sample sometime between 15,000 and 21,000 years ago. And if you'll see, I was trying to get kind of where it gets rockier here from where it's smoother, which is the same as the bottom of this mammoth bone, right? They're blind about that same contact. So two different methods with about the same age, that's good, you know, that we have some agreement with those things. But it's unclear if you're at any Ice Age flood sediments there. So um, I took the re reference to Ice Age floods totally out of this one because I was trying to squish it down. But um, the, the, the location of this looks like it's out of the floods from the backed up Yakima River um, by a few miles. So um, presumably we're higher and a little farther away anyway. And so there's no necessary expectation to have anything that relates but we, we did do um, more dating 
up and down this column and description of the sediments also, which I can talk about more in a minute. You want me to change the, is the lighting okay for both being able to see that and this? Okay. All right, now, now, so far, I really have been talking about this whole thing like I'm a paleontologist, which I might play one on TV, sort of, but I'm not actually a paleontologist. Um, I'm an archaeologist, and we have made our story with the general public even more confused trying to tell people the difference between paleontology and archaeology by doing a project like this because I'm doing a little bit of both. So paleontologists study past life, but archaeologists are interested in people in particular, and the kind of stuff that people leave behind. So really, I usually say that I'm a glorified garbage collector, because archaeologists like to look at the trash that people leave behind. So how does this thing relate to archaeology? So far, not at all. But we do have a couple of little rocks that may be artifacts, in which case it's both archaeological and paleontological. So this is the one that has the most potential. And I didn't realize until the History Channel bit came out that they were showing you the uninteresting flat side of that rock. <laughs> it has nothing useful to say. It's net, we don't care about the edges. Why do they say the edges are useful? The edges are all broken. They tell us nothing helpful. So that's the History Channel. Um, if you flipped it over, the thing that's more interesting about this to an archaeologist is that See, this edge here is parallel to that, which is parallel to that, which is parallel to that. That's what's interesting to us, because if you think about it, okay, if we're trying to distinguish a rock that just rolled around in a stream or something and broke, versus a rock that people broke, one of the things that might be helpful is if that rock basically got hit in the same direction multiple times, the more parallel edges, the less likely it is to happen in nature. Right? So you can see a rock rolling around banging into another rock and making a thin flake, but is it likely to happen three or four times at the exact same orientation? Much less likely. It looks like a broken bit of what our archaeologists call a blade, a long, skinny flake tool. So maybe it's an artifact. We'll revisit that in a minute. Why would that matter? Because in North America so far, well, and South America for that matter, there really aren't that many sites where there's a really strong connection between uh, extinct animals like mammoths and human artifacts. So what does that mean? We don't have any doubt that people were hunting things like mammoths. In fact, I've been told that on the Yakima Reservation and the Colville Reservation there are oral histories of mammoth hunting, which is pretty cool. But is this particular site evidence of that? We only got like a dozen or so really good sites in North and South America that show that connection. So if we can make a connection here, it would be kind of a big deal. And then the other thing is, I just talked about how old these bison and mammoth bones are, right? So they're about 17,000 years old. That's about 3,000 years older than most archaeologists accept for the earliest dated stuff in North America. So if this is really an artifact, and if... This really belongs with the age of those. That would be a big deal, too, because it pushed back the scientifically documented time frame for another 3,000 years or so. So you might be getting a sense of why things might be controversial, which I'll revisit here in a minute. Anyway, we found it where that pink flag was. That's why I got that on that picture. So the kind of notchy things on the flake, along the flag, that doesn't mean anything? Well, this is the only intact edge. Broken, 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 broken. So you really can't say a lot about all those other portions. In a sense, it's like it's a tiny little piece. And so you say, well, that's not like the smoking gun exactly, is it? It's pretty arguable. Yes. But that's what we have to work with, right? We don't have a really obvious sort of thing. Okay, so what have we got figured out so far? All right, so um, I just recently changed this from the general public version to the more science-y version because it was the actual <laughs> science seminar series. So I got more statistically looking things. But we, we can gloss over those. Um, anyway, the, the one thing we did was we tried to say, okay, if it's really an artifact, how old is it? We can't date the rock directly. There's no good method. But we can use that same method of dating the grains of dirt and try to get them from around that and then try to date the dirt that it's in to say how old it is. That was the idea. So I had um, 
Jim Feathers from the Luminescence Dating Laboratory over at the University of Washington. He came over and he took samples that he brought back to his lab and, and he really does serious work on these things more than you would get just for doing it commercially. So anyway, out of the samples he took 94 individual grains and, and dated those with this method. And the, the gist of it is on this graph here. So basically what he decided was, see each of these little black dots is an age estimate. Turns out that Almost all of them can be resolved to two components. Either they're 17,000-year-old, roughly, or 5,000-year-old, roughly. So what does that mean? If 80% of them are about 17,000 years old, that's good because that's the age the bones say, and that means it's consistent with the age the dirt and the bones are about the same age. Good. And if you're kind of a, I don't know, betting person, it's like 80% odds that that flake really is as old as the bones, which would be... Interesting. Maybe too old, though, to the conservative people. Uh, the 20% of the grains, though, are about 5,000 years old, which means if you're more conservative or you don't believe those archaeologists are trying to push the envelope and say things are older than they should be, then clearly it's a 5,000-year-old flake that fell down a rodent furrow, and I just couldn't see the rodent furrow. <laughs> Something like that. Which is not at all impossible. I cannot deny that that's a possibility. So some people think this is a terrible result. I think it's great for cowards because whether you like it to be old, you like it to be recently and explained away, you can both have what you want, right? Well, maybe I sidestepped a little bit of controversy, but not completely. Another thing we said is, all right, is it really an artifact? So what we did is I said, all right, let's collect all of the rocks that we excavate that are the same kind of material people make chipstone tools out of and then see if the rocks in the hillside and the rocks that I think are artifacts are different. Because if it's basically similar to the other rocks, then they're what archaeologists have coined the term geofact. That basically means it looks like an artifact, but nature made it. So it's not really an artifact made by people. So that's the argument. Is it an artifact, or does it just look like one? So comparing like this best possible artifact versus the, the sample of toolstone, you can get a sense from that picture that pretty much they're not that similar, right? The, the, uh, the toolstone and the thing is uh, overwhelmingly more rounded and more spherical and this sort of browner color and things like this are kind of very rare compared to the rocks. So that would imply that you can't easily explain it away as a geofence. And then here's another thing we did. We said, okay, if you score all of these things based on some archaeological attributes of whether it's a flake, you compare it to ones that we actually made ourselves, you can make a nice graph that shows that, okay, all of the stuff from the excavated rocks has very little, but these uh, flint nap ones or these two numbers here are the two possible artifacts really don't match. So, the moral story is they don't look like the rocks in the side of the hill. So probably they're artifacts. But you notice I'm being very cautious about all this, partly because in order to get this published, I went to one journal, five reviewers rejected it after I got done being depressed, went to a second journal, uh, sent it another five reviewers, said minor changes, which meant seven single spaced pages of changes to make in order to get. So this is a very thoroughly peer-reviewed article, and I like to bring it up when students get depressed about the red ink we write about their own thing, right? So, happy to to Okay, then we got stuff in process. So, um, I'm trying to finish the Bison paleontology, because there's so little of it, it seems like an easier chunk to do. This is all there is for the Bison remains. We do, you got that one left rear leg, all the way, all, all the way down to the toes, though and then some vertebrae to go along with it. So I'm just trying to put together a little piece to send so the paleontologists have the basic data about the, uh, about the bison. There's no sign of people involved with them at all. I mean, they're complete bones. Usually on archaeological sites, people bust bones up into lots of little pieces. Any idea why do people bust bones up into lots of little pieces? Marrow. Almost invariably. The marrow inside? For the marrow. You know, that's often something that seems weird to Americans. Why would anybody want to eat marrow? Because until the last few hundred years, pretty much everywhere in the world, people had very low-fat diets. They wanted any fat they could get. Can you imagine people today 
you know, going way out of their way to scrap every little bit of fat they can possibly get. You know, Americans don't usually need lots more fat in our diet today, right? But everywhere in the world until relatively recently, that was really common. So if you got bones that are all complete, chances are pretty good that people didn't have anything to do with it. You know, pretty simple. Oh, and then another thing that we're working on here is uh, I had a, a grad student that said that she would like to try to sort out whether or not that, you know, remember that little possible flake thing was a little bit above the bones. Okay, so she was wondering if she could sort out the deposit that includes the flake from the deposit that includes the bones by doing a sort of like a really close interval particle size analysis and then doing a, using the master size rover in geology to try to get the distribution and see if she could see different pulses of a mudslide or something like that. Um, so anyway, I'm not going to, we're basically out of time, but she tried to figure out whether or not it might make a good argument that there's separate deposits. So we're, we're trying to hit all the different things we can to sort out whether or not people had anything to do with this site and whether it's real artifacts. And then I still got to do figuring out the mammoth bones and looking at all the mammoth bones to try to figure out, you know, is it possible people did hunt this animal and left cut marks or something like that on the bones. We need to look at all the bones and their breakage and stuff like that to try to tell. So, okay, so it's, uh, I hit the 50 minute mark, so I should definitely stop talking, but I'm, and anybody needs to leave, certainly welcome to do so, but if you have any questions or stuff, I'm happy to uh, continue with that. And uh, mammoth bones made it all the way around, huh? <laughs>